Are there some things in some of the new bio tracking that excite you? Like what's happening now or what's what's going to be coming here in the next three to five years? The, the issue that I've been fascinated with in the last year is uh, breathing, yeah, strangely enough. Uh, you know, it is the as a as a group from the UK, they wrote an article about it. it was the kind of the forgotten vital sign or whatever you know. And, and if you if you're unconscious, you've been injured, and you are wheeled into a hospital, the first two things that the doctors or nurses will evaluate is is your heart beating, are you breathing, and then more specifically, what's your heart rate, what's your breathing rate, right? And that has extremely, you know, a lot of value for them in making some initial decisions about the state of your body. These are called vital signs. Now, in sports, we have discovered decades ago the, the heart rate as a window into the human physiology, into, uh, you know, what what intensity am I working at relative to my max? And it's a powerful tool. And, and, and we've done a great job in, in making that accessible to, to people and, and calib pretty good job at calibrating it and so forth. But it is, there are situations, there are movement situations, training situations where heart rate doesn't tell you everything you'd like to know. For example, during, during interval training, during these, you know, different kinds of stochastic work with lots of variations in tempo and that heart rate kind of may find a, a middle zone that's reflective of the overall oxygen demand, but your brain is saying, yeah, but this is harder than that, <laughs> right? Because uh -huh. those peaks are costing me a lot, yeah. you know? Well, if we measure your breathing, even something as simple as your breathing rate, just... <sighs> What, what breathing frequency are you at? It tracks with the realities that you're facing in terms of getting that work done, of mobilizing, maintaining that pace in those repeats or in those intervals, even better than heart rate. And that's one of the things that's fascinated me that I've, because I was looking at the heart rate, you know, I was, I've developed some tools. I've spoken a lot about cardiac drift, about internal workload versus external workload, how these Inter, you know, there's no such thing as a steady state during training and that you can we can measure this kind of internal workload shift relative to the external. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, and it works and it's important and it's useful. And it tells us that, that the, the first hour run of a two hour run is not the same as the second hour. The second hour is harder, even though the pace is the same. You can't equate those. Uh, because they are your efficiency. Things are breaking down in your body. You are, it's costing more to do that same work, whether it's cycling or rowing or swimming or running. And so we have to be cognizant of that. And we have to understand that intensity has no meaning without, under, without putting a duration to it. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. It's a, it's a unidimensional construct that only has meaning when we get, we add duration, yeah. you know, right. I can hold, any pace up to 1,300 watts for a second, you know, uh, but, but already, <laughs> after ten, burn. Yeah. yeah, but already after 10 seconds, I've lost a lot of, you know, and after two minutes, it's a different, so it only these power values and pace values only have meaning when I attach a duration to them. Right. And they, and it's, we're not in a steady state heart rate reflects some of that, but in that very high intensity regime and the stochastic regime where you're doing lots of this, you know, up and down cross country. And so ventilation tells us some things. And you know that if you've raced, you know, you've, you can hear your competition. How are they breathing? You, uh, you know, and you make, and there's famous examples of athletes that have kind of come up to the side of an athlete, you know, and, and can tell they're breathing hard and then they attack, you know, or, yeah. or they hide, they try to hide the fact that they're like, <gasps> you know, so they're, you know, they're trying to hold their breath for as, as they run up, to, you know, so we know it instinctively that breathing hell is a truth teller, right? So uh, long story short, we're doing, we're really getting into the weeds and trying to understand breathing and, and what it can tell us and whether we can use it as a, 
We can scale breathing relative in the same way we can do with heart rate reserve, where you take maximum heart rate versus resting heart rate. And you have the percentage of the heart rate reserve. Mm-hmm. You, can do that. you can do that with breathing too. You can do that with breathing frequency. Yeah. When does it change over, right? Yeah. And you can find your athletes kind of maximum breathing frequency when they're really in the cellar all the way, maximum effort. You know what the resting breathing frequency is. It's pretty typical, 12 to 16, somewhere in there. And so you can establish this range and then you can use that as a as an intensity scale. And it turns out it has more scope than the heart rate part of the scale, you know. So anyway, I don't want to get too far in the weeds, but that is a variable that is very basic and new technology is making it possible for that to be kind of measured just as easily or easier than heart rate in the daily grind. And so we'll see whether that can add, can help us do a better job of monitoring and and, and perceiving where we are and and, and when to say, Matt, that's enough. You know, I've, I've... done enough work today I, i'm at you know 85 percent of my breathing frequency if i go farther than that then i'm really starting to i'm going to blow up you know then it's too yeah. much you know and, and i think we're going to get there and so that's that's an area that i'm spending a lot of time on right now i, I love hearing that like i've previously had uh the Iceman wim hoff on the podcast when we talked about breathing quite a bit and about how you can also like if, if you're very highly stressed, how to reset your uh, autonomous nervous system through breathing. And then I had Patrick McCowan uh, on the podcast as well. And we talked about nasal breathing quite a bit, which is another topic that I thought was quite fascinating. Yeah, I've done Just, that. I've tried that. I, I, I saw you on Twitter. Like, please, please describe a little bit more about the crossover, what you started noticing. Well, you know, if you see in the video, I've got a pretty solid nose here. So I, I probably have some, I have some anatomical advantages for nose breathing, but, but uh, yeah, I, you know, I saw these initial things about it and I thought, I, and I've done a few workouts, two hour rides inside, outside, you know, just breathing through my nose. And my question was, and I even had a master's project where we tested this uh, last year. Uh, the idea that nose breathing acts as a poor man's uh, kind of governor to to make to make sure you're below your first lactate turn point. Uh, it turns out that's not true. It doesn't work that way. It, right. you, there are with training, people can get quite good at breath, nose breathing and they can achieve pretty darn high intensities just with, you know, without opening their mouth. So that doesn't work. Uh the, but there are other questions that are kind of interesting. You know, there's been discussion about whether there are different uh, neurological hormonal issues that emerge when you just breathe through your nose. And I, I don't know enough about that. But I just I do know that I, fi- I find it uh, interesting that, you know, on a good day, if my nasal passages are open and I just breathe through my nose for two hours, it's kind of calming. It's kind of, mm-hmm. you know, it's kind of like it's almost meditative. You know? <laughs> and, yeah. And, and so I've done some nice, easy, steady state, you know, like 200 watts for two hours of just breathing through my nose. And it's, I like, I kind of like it. It's got, it's got a certain, I don't know, there, there is a certain mindfulness aspect to it. Once you get past the first few weeks, not bombs that are just dripping out of your nose. like. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, it's kind of, for me, it's like, there are just days if I'll try and I like immediately my brain will just, no, I ain't doing it today. It doesn't work. <laughs> I'm, I'm a bit tight in the nose. Whereas other days, you know, okay, this is going to happen. You know, so it, it, I kind of, my body just gives me a feedback pretty quickly, whether this is going to happen or not today. You know? yeah. <laughs> I've pushed myself pretty far up the scale and I was able to get to almost like 300 Watts, which for me is a pretty high intensity, just breathing through my nose.